Jerusalem is our red line. That's the message from the Turkish president as he opened a gathering of Muslim leaders to discuss the recent US decision on the holy city. But beyond words, what else can be done? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the program. I'm Laura Kyle. Jerusalem's status as part of Israel or Palestine or both has long been a controversial issue many politicians have shied away from. But Donald Trump changed decades of US policy last week by recognizing the city as Israel's capital. That decision set off worldwide protests and condemnation. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan convened a meeting of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation or OIC on Wednesday to discuss a response. He said the U.S. decision was illegal and Jerusalem was a red line. The final communique said the United States should withdraw from its role in pe the peace process. But what can the 57-member organization realistically do to pressure the U.S.? Here's what Erdogan suggested at the event. I would like to call all nations around the globe to respect international law, to rise up and recognize Jerusalem as the occupied capital city of the state of Palestine. We will never give up on our demand for a free and sovereign Palestinian state, the capital of which is Jerusalem. And as Islamic countries, we condemn the violence of Israeli soldiers vis-à-vis -vis our Palestinian brothers and sisters protesting the latest decision of the United States. Well, after the meeting, the OIC members released a statement echoing those thoughts, calling on the world to recognize East Jerusalem as the Palestinian capital. Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas also attended the meeting, and here's what he had to say. The United States chose to lose its role and eligibility as a mediator and not to have a role in the political process. We will not accept any American role in the political process from now on. The U.S. is biased to Israel. That is our position. This is a major crime that requires us to come out with decisive decisions that protect the identity of Jerusalem until we end the Israeli occupation of the state of Palestine. Well, issues concerning Jerusalem go right to the heart of the OIC as an organization. It was formed in September 1969 after an Australian man set fire to part of the Al-Aqsa Mosque in East Jerusalem. It's the third holiest site in Islam. Today, there are 57 members of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation spanning four continents. The group calls itself the collective voice of the Muslim world, and it meets every three years to address issues of peace, governance and development. Let's go now to our guests and joining us from Ankara, Yusuf Kanli, journalist and former editor of Turkey's Hurriyet Daily News. In Tel Aviv, Gideon Levy, columnist with Haaretz newspaper. And in Amman, Moen Rabani, a senior fellow at the Institute for Palestine Studies. A very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, Yusuf, Turkey, in the, calling this emergency summit, sought a common response to the US declaring Jerusalem as Israel's capital. It certainly got a common response, but it was all words. Uh, first of all, uh, it was important for the Muslim countries to have a common voice against uh, what Ankara uh, categorized from the beginning as a provocative action by the American presidency. Uh, because so far, Islamic uh, states keep on talking about the Palestinian problem, but no one is taking concrete action, concrete firm action, further than condemnation of Israeli uh, actions or uh, attitudes taken against the Palestinians. Now, for the first time, we have a concrete step. The summit has called on the, uh, all countries, members of the Islamic Conference and others, to recognize uh, Israel at uh, Jerusalem as the occupied capital of Palestine. Okay. Moin, would you, would you agree the, with the that? Would you can, see the outcome the out of today's summit as a concrete step in the right direction? I think it's, it's a, um, a step in the right direction, but I wouldn't quite call it a concrete step. I mean, the meeting called on its member states um, to make this declaration of recognition, but we'll have to see to what extent it's actually um, uh, implemented. I mean, I, I would have 
very much expected to see something um, uh, significantly more concrete in, in terms of the member states of the OIC announcing and adopting specific measures at the meeting, not only vis-a-vis -vis their relations with the Palestinians, but more importantly, in respect of their relations with Israel and with the United States, because um, many OIC members maintain relations with Israel, and all of them maintain relations, or virtually all of them maintain relations uh, with the United States. And so I think uh, if we look at what actually happened today, it can safely be considered at the level of declarations rather than concrete action. Gideon, Israel will certainly have been watching this summit. Uh, do you think it was wary of any action taken against it, or did it feel that it was pretty secure in the fact that 57 nations were not going to take any concrete action in regards to it, or, as Moin says, the United States? Fortunately or unfortunately, Israel can remain quite indifferent to what's going on in Ankara because by the end of the day, it will remain as a lip service, another lip service to the Palestinian cause, not much more than this. And in any case, Israel has its own ties with some of those countries, and those ties will remain. And Israel can trust the United States more than ever before. What does it need more than this? Would you agree with that, Yusuf, that it is only lip service, that these countries are not going to break ties with Israel, and they're certainly not going to break ties with the United States? First of all, uh, why should they break ties with Israel? It was the American administration, the Trump administration, that declared Jerusalem the capital of Israel. That they recognized that decision. Israel, uh, the proclamation was done long ago. It's there. There's something else. The Trump administration, by acting so, demonstrated that it is not an honest broker. Because mm. the crux of the Palestinian-Israeli problem is the future of Jerusalem itself. Now, the Islamic Conference Organization is coming up with a concrete position. That's what I am saying. They say East Jerusalem is the uh, occupied uh, Palestinian uh, capital. Two, they say the United Nations should con Security Council should convene and discuss this issue. Three. If the United Nations Security Council does not do so, then they will call the General Assembly to take action on the issue. These are, uh, I think, uh, if anyone was expecting the Islamic Conference Organization and its members to cut relations with the uh, United States or Israel just because of uh, the Jerusalem decision, I think that would be too much. OK. Uh, what about the Turkish foreign minister, Çavuşoğlu, saying that some Arab countries have not taken a hard enough line, we've seen very little Arab reaction, on Jerusalem issue because Trump scares them? Do you think that rings true, Yusuf? It, it, it is a reality. I mean, uh, as uh, my friends were co uh, complaining as well, the Arab uh, nations keep on paying a lip service to the Palestinian problem, but when it comes to taking firm action, they uh, start uh, pondering how not to do anything. Uh, it's, uh, I hope this time it will not be so. And in a way, Chaushola was uh, diplomatically putting, uh, underlining that reality. The Arab nations now should come up something concrete, something firm and uh, con uh, bring forward mm. the plight of the Palestinian people. Moin, do we expect to see something coming from this? I mean, first of all, what's your response to the Arab reaction so far? Would you have hoped for a stronger united response amongst Arab countries? I wouldn't have expected um, a stronger response from the recent Arab League meeting for the simple reason that um, these are leaders and governments who, on the whole, are increasingly estranged from their people, who in many cases um, are either close partners of the United States or rely on the United States either for their own security and survival or rely on the United States in terms of conflicts that they themselves are waging either amongst themselves or uh, against uh, other states. 
and in, in that context, I don't think they're going to privilege anything concerning the Palestinians over the, their bilateral relations uh, with, with the United States. And I think, you know, nevertheless, it's, it's not meaningless that at a time when Arab states and governments are so divided over the various conflicts in the region, mm. Syria, Yemen, Libya, and so on, that they could at least um, not be divided by the Palestine question as, as well. That's not meaningless, but under the circumstances, it's certainly not particularly significant either. You now have what might be called an incipient rebellion in the occupied territories that needs concrete support and assistance. None of that has been forthcoming, either from the Arab League or from uh, the Organization of the Islamic Conference. Similarly, these states could, for example, have put in provisions to uh, make their own relations with third parties, whether Israel or the United States or others, dependent on how they respond to this um, latest American declaration at various levels of, of seriousness, and they've failed to do any of that. But I also have to say, we are also living in a reality where the Palestinian leadership itself has not yet met and put forward a clear set of resolutions and an agenda and, and demands. And I think that's really the biggest shortcoming in this whole equation, is that it's ultimately up to the Palestinians themselves to take the lead in confronting this new reality. And so far, at least at the leadership level, they have signally failed to do so. And Gideon, that, that's a good point, isn't it? We haven't seen any joint Palestinian leadership on this issue. Yeah, you can uh, expect very little from the Palestinians in their present conditions. They are still bleeding from the Second Intifada. They are divided. They are weak. They lack uh, leadership. They lack spirit of struggle. You see, it's, it's a lost generation mm. under the occupation, which really looks for its way. And the only thing they, ca they are capable right now to do is again and again those individual acts which lead to nowhere and are totally meaningless. And I think we'll have to wait for another generation to, to restore and to regain energy for a real struggle. This generation seems to be lost. That's a, that's a long time to wait. I mean, if we look to Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian president, he had been accused of, of being too moderate in his response. Today, at this conference, we saw him coming out stronger. He was saying he will no longer accept the US role in the peace process. Gideon, was that something that you expected to see from him? No, it's really too little and too late. Mm. It's totally irrelevant. There is no peace process, obviously. And, you know, in many ways, one should be grateful to Donald Trump also because he put an end to this masquerade. He put an end to this masquerade that the United States is an even mediator. He put an end to the notion that uh, the United States is supporting the two-state solution. And Donald Trump came and said, no, we are not even-handed. We support the occupation. There is only one people who has rights in this part of the world, and this is the Jewish-Israeli people. And the Palestinians deserve nothing, even not half of a capital. And, you know, in many times it's better to face reality rather than to continue the masquerade of peace process to state solution and all those things that led to nowhere over 50 years now. Yusuf, would you agree with that, that this uh, U.S. announcement has exposed the U.S. for what it is, not totally. an honest broker? Totally. Totally. I mean, uh, uh, all through the uh, past many years, did we ever see an honest uh, American broker in the uh, uh, Arab-Israeli conflict? Uh, for a time, perhaps the Clinton presidency. For a time, perhaps the uh, uh, Obama presidency, briefly. But in, in overall assessment, the American policy has always been pro-Israeli. And uh, as my friend just put it, in a way, focusing only on the problems or, or, or focusing on a solution that will serve the interests of uh, Israel. Whereas this problem is not just, of course, the problem of Jerusalem, but is a problem of an occupied land 
a problem of people deprived of their homes, of their property, of their land, of their homeland. Therefore, uh, this problem is a humanitarian tragedy. Mm. And for that, of course, neither the United States can play an honest broker role, and unfortunately, uh, neither Turkey can play an honest broker role. Perhaps now we are making a return to the quartet. Okay, uh, Moeen, I... In hope so, perhaps they could do something. Okay, Moeen, I know you and I uh, touched on this last week, just on Inside Story, discussing the same uh, subject. If not the US as the mediator in the process, is there an alternative? Is there the quartet, as you have suggested? Or is the process just now dead in the water until the next generation, as uh, perhaps Gideon believes? Well, I, I think the quartet is as compromised as the United States, primarily because uh, the quartet is essentially an American uh, creation intended to circumvent the international community and the United Nations and so on. I mean, I'd, I'd very much like to believe um, that Gideon Levy is right. My fear, and I think the real scandal, would be that if this latest measure um, does not lead uh, to a situation in which the U.S. is no longer able to play uh, the role of exclusive mediator in, in the Arab-Israeli and Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflicts. In other words, I think it's, it's not impossible that Arab states, including this Palestinian leadership, despite the words that we've heard, will continue to try to find a way to go along uh, with these, you know, various initiatives and, and plans and so on that are being hatched uh, by the Trump team. I think the obvious alternative is to look at least um, uh, for an expansion of the mediator role. I mean, some people have proposed something along the lines of um, an international committee, a P5 plus one, mm. something along those lines, as we had with the Iranian nuclear agreement. But I think even more important than the form of, of any mediation is a substance. In other words, clear terms of reference, clear objectives, a clear agenda, clear deadlines, clear arbitration mechanisms, clear enforcement of any arbitration and, and all the rest of it. But I think as the previous two speakers have noted, we're a very long way off um, from even getting to the point where those are questions that can be seriously considered simply because of the gross imbalance of of, of power on the ground, and I think that has to be addressed uh, first before we can return to these larger diplomatic mm. questions. Okay. Again, is it not something of a good thing to shake things up, to see this uh, shake up? Because whatever else Trump has said and done, he did say that this peace process needed new thinking, that, nothing, that it was going nowhere and that it's gone nowhere for 20 years. I mean, he was right about that, wasn't he? Yeah, he was right about that, but don't expect Donald Trump to suggest an alternative. And the alternative is there. We have to change the discourse. We have to start to talk about equal rights. We have to realize that there will never be a two-state solution because Israel never had the intention to go for the two-state solution. And with over 700,000 settlers, which will never be, a, be evacuated, there is no viable Palestinian state. So. I, I'm not sure that Donald Trump meant this, mm, but mm. I think that anybody who is he, honest enough should draw the conclusions. And the conclusions are very clear. We failed with the two-state solution. We have to rethink, restart. We have to start to talk about equal rights, about one person, one vote. And let's challenge Israel. Because if Israel says no to this, Israel is declaring itself as an official apartheid state. And if Israel says no to this, and there is another apartheid state, it's about to the world, about the world to decide, do we accept another apartheid state in the 21st century? Yes or no? And then the world will be challenged to do something like it did with South Africa, or just to continue to hug this apartheid state, finance it and, and supply it with arms, and say, we live with it in peace. Yusuf, do you believe that the world is almost at the point where it can challenge Israel? Yeah, we have to face the reality. Israel has nuclear capability. The Americans are firmly behind Israel. Uh, the Arab world is divided and uh, it cannot come up with a common position. This is a very rare development here. 
Mm. But uh, as my friends already said, let's see what will be the translation of this into reality. What action they will take uh, tomorrow. Uh, therefore, uh, the Palestinian people uh, don't... I mean, how can they have much expectation that their problem might uh, come to an end tomorrow? It's a very delicate and uh, very uh, imbalanced situation uh, that uh, finding a way out appears to be very difficult. How can this be... Uh, I mean, if, if somehow uh, the Islamic world starts uh, implementing uh, decisions firm enough, uh, like the, uh, boy, uh, the oil boycott of the 70s, then perhaps something can be done. Mm. But uh, at this point, no government in the area feels secure enough to challenge the, uh, the, the American leadership. The uh, Arab Spring in quotes, uh, or Arab Fire, whichever you, where you look at it, is still fresh in minds. What happened in Syria is there. What happened in Iraq is there. Uh, the uh, Libya situation is okay. there. Therefore, taking firm action requires uh, real courage. Uh, Gideon, the, the, the uh, US Vice President Mike Pence is in the region next week. What sort of reception do you think he's going to get? First of all, the Palestinians declared that they are not going to accept him and receive him. And I, I hope, I must say frankly, I hope they will stick to their word. Mm. Because also this ritual in which Americans and others are coming to Israel, spend two, three days in Israel, and then go to, for two hours to meet Abbas in Ramallah. And by this, they show that they are so even-handed and so fair. I mean, also this masquerade can come to its end. The, the, what should Abbas talk now with the deputy uh, uh, president of the United States? What? What about? What can he do for him? What, what does, he, does he have any intention at all to bring to any kind of justice or any kind of progress? The, the Americans have no intention to put an end to the Israeli occupation. And as long as this is the situation, all the rest is really rituals and photo opportunities, which we are sick and tired now after 50 years of watching this masquerade, as I, as I said before. Moeen, just as our, our final thoughts, we've got the OIC meeting next month. That was what came out of today's meeting. They say they want to keep the momentum going, but do you feel that there is any momentum there to be kept going? Not particularly. I mean, um, you know, prior to this meeting, and I think even prior to the Trump announcement, you had, for example, Turkish President Erdogan saying that if the United States were to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital, that um, uh, Turkey would sever relations with Israel. It hasn't done so. Then you had the meeting today at which, unfortunately, the level of representation for many member states was quite lacking. And I think we can also agree that the resolutions and conclusions were fairly weak. I think what really we should look to now is the people on the ground, mm. particularly the mobilization within the occupied territories, but not only there, also in, in other states in the region and to a lesser extent around the world. And I think it will only be on account of effective mobilization and pressure um, from the ground up that these leaders who, as I mentioned earlier, are increasingly estranged and disconnected from their people will feel uh, any need to do anything about this issue that obviously matters so much um, to the peoples of the region. Well, it's certainly a story that we will need to keep watching very closely indeed. Many thanks today. Uh, for all our guests for joining us here on Inside Story, Yusuf Kanli, Gideon Levy and Moeen Rabani. And thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, that's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle and the whole team here, bye for now.